Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 37, verses 7 through 11. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you will look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. Thank you to Mackenzie for reading and to Morgan for a wonderful children's time. Um, Morgan did a great job interpreting and uh, translating in the, um, in the Beatitudes the word for meek is gentle, compassionate, humble. It's a, it's a word with a lot of meanings and a lot of nuances. We're going to get to that a little bit. But we're now in the third week in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' great teaching. And the Sermon on the Mount, of course, begins with the Beatitudes, the eight blessings that Jesus says marks life in the kingdom of God. And, and a way to think about that is that the way Jesus says the kingdom of God is is different than the way the kingdom of the world is, that the things that are valued in the kingdom are opposite of the way they're valued in the world. And a good example of this uh, can be something I saw on the news this week. I can hardly believe, but it was 20 years ago. Did anyone catch us on the news that Princess Diana died in that accident, in that automobile accident, 20 years ago? And I remember that scene, I, I remember that, that, um, that event because... That week, somebody else also passed away who was quite well known. Does anybody remember? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. And it's the only time in all my years in the ministry that I've ever actually put away the sermon I was going to preach and redid a sermon because I thought the juxtaposition of those two lives and deaths so close together really were meaningful, that there was a message there. But I noticed this week where, um, where people were remembering Princess Diana I haven't heard or seen anything yet about Mother Teresa. Now, I believe the anniversary of her passing is uh, Tuesday, the 5th. I think it's the 5th. But it's amazing to me that what the world values and what the world honors is, you know, something like Princess Diana, who, you know, fine person, no, no problem there, but quickly forgotten about Mother Teresa, the one who gave her life serving the poorest of the poor in Calcutta. And so the Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes, opening them up, tells us that the values of the kingdom of God are vastly different than the values that are promoted here in the world. The problem, of course, as human beings is that we live in the world and we constantly have this back and forth struggle between those two. And I like the pictures, Morgan, you brought up there. They were really cool. I hope everyone got to see them. And although I haven't seen the movie, one, uh, one child, I don't know who it was, but they said they saw a movie like that. But there is a movie, isn't there, where a person has all their emotions? What's that called? Inside Out. i got to see that movie. The premise looks really good about all their little emotions. And so we live in this world where we're constantly pulled back and forth. We, we hear the Beatitudes. We hear what Jesus has blessed. And then yet the world operates on a completely different principle. And we said, well, how do we make sense of this? And how do we live through this? Well, this is what Jesus says. This is why we study this and why we live as a church together. So we're going to pick up again in the Beatitudes. Again, this is the um, third week of a what's going to be an extended series through the Sermon on the Mount. And again, friends, I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. The scripture says, When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Then we skip over to uh, later on in Matthew's gospel. We are now... Uh, The scene is the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had already uh, experienced the Last Supper with his disciples. He has been praying already, and now has come the time for his arrest. And the scripture, picking up in chapter 26, verse 47, it says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man... Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. 
With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat at the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your holy word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Well, so, um, there I was, just minding my own business. I was at a denominational church meeting. Like most Presbyterians, I was sitting way in the back, evidence here, you know, (laughs) trying to keep a low profile. And uh, sometime during the meeting, one of the bigwigs saddled up alongside me and said he'd like to have a word with me. And my first thought was, of course, "Uh uh-oh, what did I do? But it turns out it wasn't what I'd done, rather it was what I was being asked to do. You see the fellow there, one of the leaders of the Presbytery, kind of a general conference, um, he wanted to know if I would be willing to serve as the vice chair of a particular committee. And so I asked what was involved, and as he explained it, he said I'd be responsible for moderating meetings when the chair of the committee wasn't available, and then the following year when the chairman rotated off. I'd take over as chair myself, and also with that, I'd have a seat on basically the board of directors, and let me tell you, I like the sound of that. And inside, I got to admit that I was feeling pretty good about myself after that unexpected invitation. I mean, at the time, I was, I was really young. I was, I was energetic. I was enthusiastic. I was fresh out of seminary with a brand spanking new theological degree, and I thought, Hey man, people are starting to notice me. People are starting to seek me out as well they should, I thought. And so straightening my halo, putting on my humblest face, I told the guy I'd be happy to accept. But then, perhaps to prolong the moment and stroke my ego a bit, I asked, why me? Of all the people who could have filled this position, people with way more experience and expertise, why had they chosen little old me to fill this grand and glorious position, thinking perhaps it was my razor-sharp intellect or maybe my winning personality. Perhaps it was my humble spirituality. Well, they saw me as a young up-and-comer. So why me, I asked. Well, he said as he straightened up and walked away, everybody else, we asked, said no, and you're the only one left. (laughs) A true story. You know, I do that a lot, maybe less now than when I was younger, but, but I tend to build myself up in my own mind before reality comes crashing down and, and serves me up a thick slice of humble pie, and, and maybe you do it too. Maybe, like me, you've had those kind of humbling experiences, experiences when you've discovered that you're, you're not all that and, and that the world would scarcely skip a beat without you. Now... I'm not suggesting that we're unimportant and we really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. That's not at all. Not, not what I'm saying. We matter much. We matter eternally. So much so that the cross of Jesus Christ bears that out. It's just that if, if we want to embody these attitudes that Jesus calls blessed, we've got to first discover where true meaning is found. And for that, we turn again to Jesus' words in the Beatitudes, especially this third Beatitude where he declares, Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Well, let me ask it. What do you think of when you hear the word meek? A mouse of a man, a shy and timid woman, 
someone with all the backbone of a wet noodle. It's, it's, it's not a very compelling word, is it? Anybody remember that old movie, Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox? Anybody remember that movie? That's all? Yeah, okay, I thought so. This is a, this is a, I mean, I know it's a monologue, but it really is a participation here. Well, you know, it's, it, it, I was thinking about it. It's hard to believe that movie came out 32 years ago. I can't hardly believe it. And, and I bet you'd know it actually won an Oscar. I, I didn't know that. But in the movie, uh, as you know, Michael J. Fox plays a character, a very famous character named Marty McFly. And uh, Marty travels back in time to the year 1955, and he meets his parents. And his parents turn out to be a lot different than he imagined. His, his mom, Lorraine, is an attractive 17-year-old who, who's something of a flirt. And his dad, George, remember George? Well, let's just say George McFly is about the biggest wimp there is. And, you know, that's putting it kindly. George is shy and he's retiring. He, he looks like a stiff wind could blow him over. He's a complete nerd who, who spends all his free time reading science fiction about spaceships and aliens and such. And when Marty first meets him in the diner, uh, George is being picked on by a bully named Biff who forces him to do his homework for him. And, and I mean, they don't just get more, any more spineless than George McFly. And so we think, if that's what being meek is all about, well, then most of us would say, forget it. You can have it. I mean, I mean who'd want to be like that? You see, we hear the word meek, and what we actually think Jesus is saying is, blessed are the weak, or blessed are the geeks. And so this is a word with a major, major public relations problem. That's really because we don't understand what the word means. You see, we don't get what being meek in a biblical sense is all about and why it's so important. But of course, some of that's our fault. You see, deep down, and, and let's, let's face it, the, 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 the way these Beatitudes are going to impact us is to admit that we really do think like the world. And that deep down, we really have bought into the world's message of, uh, of what it takes to be successful, the things they've drummed in it since we were little. You know, that, that you've got to grab what's yours while you can. That nice guys finish last and, the, and that meek is weak. That, I mean, that's how you get ahead, right? A friend of mine um, recently accepted a call to pastor another church. In fact, last Sunday was his final Sunday in an old church, and he'll be starting his, his new call next week. And um, so it got me thinking, and ironic as it is, when, when churches are looking for new leadership, uh, and you think it would be different, but it's not, Churches typically employ the same strategies and use the same kind of language you find out in the world. And so, for example, in advertising for a pastor, one church, uh, they cited their desire, and I'm going to quote from their, uh, from their ad, they cited their desire for someone um, who was a strong leader. They wanted a dynamic communicator, someone skilled at empowering others and who had a bold approach to stewardship. You know, and I thought about it, in all my years, I have never seen the word meekness used as a quality in what a church is looking for in its leaders. Not once. Because it's not seen as an admirable quality. It's not seen as a way of, of getting ahead in the world. But Jesus said there's a different way of getting ahead, and it's a way that begins not with ourselves, but with God. You see, the word translated as meek in our reading today, and Morgan did a great job, she, she caught it, it, it has a lot of nuances, but, it, but it's a pretty complicated word. It's a word that can alternately mean things like humble or, or gentle or considerate, and, and those are all appropriate definitions, and, and they're used interchangeably. You open your Bible, you'll probably find different ways that's, that's said. But in classical Greek, the word translated as meek here is used in reference to an animal of great strength and power that has been tamed. It refers to a tamed animal. Now, what is a tame animal? Well, it's an animal that has been brought under control. And once it's been brought under control, its real power can be harnessed in you. So, so it's a creature that has become useful. So uh, think of it in terms of like a wild stallion. Uh, before that stallion can be ridden or put to use, it, it has to be broken, right? Of course, it doesn't want to be broken. It, it'll kick and it'll buck and it'll rear up. It'll thrash. It'll resist the bit. 
But until it's broken, all that power and all that energy and all that strength and all that potential, it has no real focus. It's useless. It may be the most beautiful horse in the world, but until it's been brought under control, it's absolutely useless. And really, so are we. In his book, Momentum, pastor and author Colin Smith says this. He says, the Bible compares our fallen nature to the impulse of wild animals. God says his own people are like a wild donkey and like a restless camel. And these are not flattering descriptions, but they are telling us something we need to know. By nature, he says, we are like wild animals. We have strength, but it is neither directed nor controlled. And so our energy gets used in ways that are at best unproductive and at worst destructive. If we want to become useful to God, he says, we need to get used to the hand. And by hand, he means, of course, the hand that tames. The hand that brings everything under its control. The hand that guides and directs. And so the best way to think about meekness is not about weakness. It's not about being spineless. But it's an original form. It's to think of it in terms of controlled strength. It's a focused kind of power. And at the root of it all is a deep trust and a, in the sovereignty and power of God. You see, meekness, when we get down to it, is about the self-control that comes from knowing that God is in control. And that's really what Psalm 37 is all about. Mackenzie shared that with you earlier. But, but in Psalm 37, David, he contrasts the fate of the wicked with those who fear the Lord. And, and David's point is this. He says, although the wicked look like everything always goes their way and that the world is their oyster, it's only illusion. It isn't real and it's certainly not going to last. Listen again to what he says. He says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways and when they carry out their wicked schemes. He says, refrain from anger, kind of like what Morgan was saying, and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. There's that word inherit again. He says, a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. You see, Psalm 37 assures us that even though the pushy and the aggressive and those who are only in it for themselves, although it always seems like they always get their way, God is saying it won't always be like that. Instead, God tells us to trust Him and believe that it's actually the meek, those who exercise self-control because they know God's in control, they're the ones who are ultimately blessed. It reminds me of a story of a, a notorious motorcycle gang uh, they came into a roadside dinner one day, and, and, and these guys, I mean, they were, just, they were just plain old mean. They were looking for trouble. And as uh, soon as they come into the diner, they, they notice a trucker sitting off by himself eating dinner. And so, you know, they're a mean bunch of guys, and the leader of the gang walks up to him, and uh, he picks up his plate of spaghetti, and he dumps it all over the trucker's head. Then he takes the guy's beer and he just turns it over and he pours it into his lap and all the other gang members are just laughing it up. They're loving it. And the trucker, well, you know, he, he didn't do anything. Just picked up his hat, paid his check, and he walked out the door. Well, the gang leader kind of smirked and looked over at the waitress and said, not much of a man, is he? The waitress just smiled back and said, yeah, not much of a driver either. He just ran over 12 Harleys on his way out of the parking lot. <laughs> well, we can, we can relate, right? I mean, deep down, we have this intuitive sense of fairness where we believe, or at least we hope, that things work out and everybody will get what's coming to them in the end. And God says they will. Everyone will get what's coming to them, but not because of pushiness or assertiveness or aggression, but because the final results are always in God's hands. That's what Jesus means when he says about the meek inheriting the earth, that those who believe and live as though the final results are in God's hands instead of their own, they end up exactly getting that. They get a future inheritance which the scriptures say can never perish or spoil or fade away. They get that. And they get the peace that that kind of future assurance brings with it right now. 
Lee Strobel is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, former investigating reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He's also the author of 20 books, over 20 books actually, and including the bestseller of The Case for Christ, and a lot of you I know have read that. But um, one time Lee Strobel was a committed atheist, and uh, he found the idea of an all-powerful, all-loving God and creator, he found it absurd, and, and it, he thought he'd go about proving that God didn't exist, but he um, thought it would be really easy, but um, he had a lot of people praying for him at the time, including his wife, and uh, at the risk of vastly oversimplifying a much longer story, he says that people, while he was in this period of, uh, of actually aggression toward the gospel, he says people were praying to God for him to give him a new heart and to give him a new spirit. And then he says this, he says, God began to answer that prayer. As I opened my life to him and yielded myself to him, I began to seek to follow his ways, and now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he said, my attitudes, my philosophy, my worldview, my professional standards, my marriage, my job, everything, he says, began to change. Before that, my little daughter, Allison, had only known in her first five years a dad that was angry. He says, I remember I was so frustrated from work one day, I kicked the wall and put my foot right through it. Anger over life and frustrations, that's all she knew of her dad. I'd come home drunk or angry, and that's all she had known. And then five or six months after I became a Christian, having seen how God changed my attitude in my life, she came up to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he did for Daddy. It's amazing, isn't it? Only five years old and that little girl could tell a difference. You see, true meekness is about power and strength that has been brought under control. It's not about weakness. It's not about being a wimp. It's about a new power controlling our lives. That's what Lee Strobel discovered, and that's what his little girl saw in him. And that's what Jesus promises us as well. But here's, these just aren't pious words here. Jesus actually practiced what he preached. And did you notice everything going on in our last reading when the religious leaders came to arrest him? As soon as they seize him, one of Jesus' followers, he grabs a sword and he cuts off somebody's ear trying to defend Jesus. You see, the disciples figured, that's just the way it works. Might makes right, it's how things are. But what Jesus wanted them to understand, and what he wants us to understand, is that God's kingdom isn't a kingdom of overwhelming power. It's a kingdom of overwhelming love. And sure, God, God has the power to overwhelm everything if he wanted to. And we often wonder why sometimes he doesn't do just that. Why doesn't he snap his fingers and overwhelm all the wickedness, all the bad things in the world in one fell swoop? That would fix everything, right? But what we don't understand is if God would simply overwhelm all the wickedness in the world like that, he would also overwhelm us. Because without the corresponding change of heart and soul that Jesus came to make possible, we'd fall under God's wrath too. That's what Jesus meant us to see, and that's why he said he came. He said he didn't come so others could fight for him. He said he came so he could fight for us. To go to a cross he didn't deserve. To atone for sins he didn't commit. And as the scriptures say, in so doing, to bring many sons to glory. See, when it came to his mission on the cross, Jesus demonstrated what perfect meekness is all about. As Peter would write many years later, it said when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And in the end, that's what meekness is all about. It's not about being weak. It's not about being faint-hearted or spineless. I mean, we could hardly say that about Jesus, right? Instead, it's about the self-control that comes from knowing God's in control. That's the life, Jesus says, will ultimately be blessed. General Peter Pace uh, is former chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he tells a story about himself back when he was a young captain during the Vietnam War. There was an event in Vietnam, he says, where I almost made a very serious mistake. We had been on patrol, and a young Marine named Lance Corporal Guido Farinaro, 19 years old, from Bethpage, New York, very close to where I grew up. General Pace says he was killed by a sniper. 
The bullet came from a nearby village. I was the platoon leader, and he was my machine gun squad leader. I was enraged. And so I called in an artillery strike to get the sniper. Then I looked to my right and saw my platoon sergeant. He didn't say a thing, but he simply looked at me, and I knew what I was about to do was wrong. So I called off the artillery strike, and we swept the village as I should have done in the first place. We found nothing but women and children as the sniper was long gone. But Pace never forgot the lessons he learned from that deadly mistake he almost made, those lives he almost took. He said, I don't know that I could have lived with myself had I done what I originally planned to do. And then he says, regardless of what you do in your life, hold on to your moral compass. I learned that day to think through what was going to happen each day thereafter and to think through what I would allow myself to do and not to do. He says it could come in a meeting, in a test, a temptation or whatever. If you have thought through who you want to be at the end of each day, you will see that person. But if you have not, you may, you may not like the person you end up being because the waves of emotion will roll over you and they're so strong that if you're not holding on to an anchor that you already have thought through, well, you can get swept away. And he says, thanks to my sergeant, I did not get swept away. Well, you know, we all need an anchor, don't we? Something to keep us from getting swept away. And Jesus, well, Jesus says it's this. To trust that although the world seems one way, that the power and the sovereignty of God wins out in the end. And that for those who believe and put their faith in him, well, they not only gain a new kind of strength, but they also gain the wisdom for how to apply that strength so they can be used of God now as they wait for the blessed inheritance he promises is sure to come later. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus, your son, who in his meekness his reliance on you showed us what perfect strength is all about. We thank you for him, Lord, who, who gave himself, Lord, completely into your care. He did not retaliate, Lord, because he knew that, Lord, you had all things under control, Lord, and you would vindicate him in the end. And so we thank you for our Savior who tr shows us what true power and true strength is all about power under control, this focused strength. Lord, we admit that we're far from that. A lot of times we're like that trucker who runs over the motorcycles, that, and we feel good about it. Um, that's because we've been conditioned, Lord, to think a certain way. But by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, condition us to think differently. Condition our souls, Lord, by the Spirit to live out the realities of the kingdom. And to trust that the world we see now is not the world that will ultimately be. Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And so we thank you, Lord. We, we pray for our church that we would be that kind of church, Lord. A meek church even, Lord. A church of uh, gentleness, but of great controlled focus and power. That, Lord, we would be faithful in our witness to you. Faithful to one another. We pray for our church family, our our friends, Lord, those who need special prayer today. Lord, for all those prayer cards that get submitted each week, all those concerns, we lift those up before you too, Lord, both inside this church and outside of it. And Lord, we know, Lord, we can trust you. And we know all things are under your care and your control. And so, Heavenly Father, hear us now as we join as one people together the way Jesus, our Savior, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
but thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand for our second hymn this morning, You Are My King.